welcome to the Chai Academy and welcome to the Chai Center. It is good to uh, be back. We have been on uh, this latest course, which each class is uh, separate from the other, but this latest course has been on Genesis. So we've gone through each day of creation and uh, we are holding day six. So day six, um, which we've discussed, is, is the animals, that every single animal was created. And, um, and then we also discussed about the human beings, how, how um, Adam and Chava, mankind, was created. And um, this is Genesis 1-1. One, one. So Genesis, uh, Genesis 1. Genesis 2, which we're nearly done with, a couple more classes perhaps, um, we will get into Genesis, Genesis 2, which talks about the real merge of Adam and Chava and ha Adam and Eve and how they were both both made and how they interacted with one another, etc., which is the concept that we have now of uh, really marriage. Hi, Eileen. So, um, so that, that, that's what we'll discuss. But right now, it was just the, the short version that the... Torah gives us that Adam was created. Adam as in mankind, once again, man and woman, etc. Hey, Susan. Also on day six, before I forget, is, um, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's especially, uh, it's applicable now, germs were created on, uh, because germs is, a, is a, it's an organism, right? It, it, so that was created on day six. So um, germs and um, the, the, the coronavirus and, and the, you know, the Gulf of it, whatever, um, H, H1N1, or what, what was it called, um, right? Ebola and um, Kawasaki and whatever, Kawasaki, whatever they, I, believe me, I don't know, the, I don't know these, uh, um, but they were also created on the sixth day. Then the Mishnah tells us that on the sixth day, after mankind was created, after Adam and Eve came into being, right at twilight, there were different things created. And we'll go through them, but we need an introduction. So what is twilight? What is twilight? So actually, it's a, a, um, a much more difficult question to answer. This is what you call a halachic conundrum. It is a Jewish law. They can't, they don't have their finger on what twilight is. Because there's sort of three, um, there's sort of three, three options as, as, as what twilight is. So is, is twilight, is twilight the the um, is twilight day? Is twilight night? Is twilight an admixture of day and night? Or <laughs> is twilight its own entity? Right? What is twilight? So according to some opinions. Um, Twilight begins when the sun is 5.9 degrees below the horizon. But it still doesn't answer whether it's night or day, or is it an admixture, or is it neither, or is it, is it, what is it, what is it? So there's, there's much discussion, and there's, there's, there's actually, there, there's, there's no clarity, and I'll explain you why there's no clarity. Because according to some uh, halakhic opinions, twilight the time it goes from day to night, twilight is a flick, right? A, 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 an eye blink, twilight, right? Twilight is very, very quick. It's, it's, it's less than a second, day to night. According to others, no, twilight is a process. Twilight takes time. It, you go from, from um, you go from, you know, it takes a period of time to go from day to night. So what is twilight? Is it day, night, 
So that's why I say it's it's complicated, and therefore, um, it it is. This is one of the the, the it, we know Judaism that as soon as it gets dark, it's the next day, right? So let's say these days it gets dark six thirty, right? Quarter to seven, whatever it is, it's the next day. It's already Friday. But here's the problem: um, what if we're wrong? What if it dark what if the day ends after the sun is 5.9 degrees below the horizon so that means shabbat begins when 5.9 degrees below the horizon or does it so therefore we light the shabbat candles 18 minutes even before sunset because we don't know if a if a male child is born twilight when is the bris? When is the circumcision? Is it day? Is it night? So that's why this this the, it's twilight is a halachic conundrum, and and it's one of the most discussed things about what is twilight, which you don't think about, right? You think of twilight. What well, really is what the halacha is telling you? It's the twilight zone. What is it? Susan, you mentioned something interesting. Other animals come out strictly in twilight. Um, so that's that's interesting. So um, and and, um, and and there's actually an, an an opinion that explain it like this, is that that twilight is 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 sort of both, because it's much loftier than both. Right. Um, let's say you're a French poet, and you want to translate your poem into English, right? You gotta have a good command of both in order to be able to turn out a poem in French or to turn out a poem in English. So God, God is, is, is you know, it, it's something loftier than day and loftier than night. And, and it's, it's something above it. You know, they say about psychologists is that there's a child psychologist Right? There's a pediatric psychologist, right? A child psychologist. Then there's an adult psychologist. And then there's one that has to know both. And that's the adolescent. True with the doctor as well, the adolescent doctors. They have to know both because it's not a child, it's not an adult. So you go to an adolescent specialist, adolescent doctor, etc. So that's what Twilight is. It's it's somewhere in it's between and betwixt. And um, according to some opinions, it's it's an extremely lofty, lofty time. It's not yet time. Um, it's not yet time to, to 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 pray the evening service. You have to wait till it's dark. I mean, you don't have to. There's all mechanisms, but the next day technically doesn't begin until it's dark. But twilight is is anyway. So at twilight, whatever this means. Now God knows what twilight. Is. Absolutely knows what twilight is, but at twilight, God created a number of things, and we're going to, um, and it is the transition. Absolutely, it's the transition. So at twilight, God is going to. Now at twilight, God created certain things. Now most of the things that we're going to talk about all seem like that they manipulate nature. So it's fascinating because Maimonides, Maimonides is of the opinion that God, that miracles are not created anew. Miracles were created during the six days of creation. That if there's a miracle that had to take place, um, if there's a miracle that had to take place, according to Maimonides, God created it during the six days of creation. Is Dawn the same question? Actually not. It doesn't have the halakhic complications. That's why. It's it's just just not. It, it's 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 very different, you know. If a child is born the dawn, we know it's the day because it has eight hours before at night and it has another eight hours to go, whatever, ten hours to go, whatever it is. So um Right, so Maimonides says, for example, Maimonides says that, that on the second day when God split the waters and 
upper waters and lower waters. On the second day, God told the waters, I'm going to need you to split again. I'm, in fact, I'm going to need you to split a couple times. Right? I'm going to need you to split during when, when the exodus from Egypt, when the Sea of Reeds, or the Red Sea, as, I, as we call it, um, split. And the, the Israelites went in the middle, and they had dry land, and the, the, um, the Egyptians followed them, and they were drowned. They got stuck in the mud. So my mommy says that was done. And also when God split the Jordan, the River Jordan, when Joshua's time, after, right after Moses, which many people don't know there was another split, but because that, that split, everybody knows, once you do it again, you know, right? Um, so there was another split. So God did that on, on the second day of creation. And likewise, other miracles that we see have all been created before, according to Maimonides. Not everybody agrees with it. So, and, and, and um, he, he, he says, he says as follows, the Mishnah says as follows, that at dusk, uh, you know, at twilight, rather, right at this this awkward time, God created the 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 opening of the earth. So we know in the in 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 the Torah, right? Mo Moses was challenged by his cousin. Moshe was challenged with a charge of nepotism by his cousin Korach, and Korach said, and Korach was really really belittling Moshe. And Korach gathered, and the first cousins, it's sad that this is Jewish tradition. No, we, we fight with our cousins. We fight with our, you know, do you know one Jewish family that um, has it together? So, um, so, so Korach he, and his children, and, and he got others, and, and many people were involved saying, you know, you take all the glory for yourself, and then you give it to your brother. And, um, and, did, and Moses says, you're not challenging me, you're challenging God. God came to me, he met me at the burning bush, and he told me, take Aaron, he told me. Anyway, so the end, the end of the sordid episode was that God opened the earth, Korach and his cohorts fell into the earth, and then the earth closed. So he says that, that and that was a, a punishment basically for, for Korach and anybody that challenged M Moses. So that was created, right? That miracle, that ability. So God spoke to the earth and says, listen, and this is Maimonides talking, at this, this exact time, earth, remember earth doesn't have free will, at this exact time, I'm going to need you to open for 10 minutes and then close. And likewise with the water, I need you to split. At this time, it's going to be in the year 2448. It's going to be, you know, six days after creation or seven days after, seven days after Exodus. I'm going to need you to split. I need you to split for three hours and I need you to come back. So all this, so, so all this was, was pre, pre thought out, pre thought out. So that's the first one. The opening of, of that Korach and, and his cohorts, it was like an earthquake that opened, you know, like you have the, the San Andreas Fault. But the thing is, it opened, it took the belongings and the tent and the people and lives, and then it closed. That's diff very different than the San Andreas Fault. Um, the other thing that happened is, is a traveling well. So when, in honor of Miriam, we know this because when she died, it disappeared. But how did they get water in the desert? Remember, they traveled for 40 years in the desert. They traveled from place to place. And they a couple times they complained about water. And then they ceased complaining. The reason why they ceased complaining is that there was this well, bottomless well, that sort of wherever they encamped, it was there. And God made it, God made that this well, this thing of water sort of traveled, traveled with them. And, um, and, and allowed the Hebrews to, to bathe, and it allowed them to drink, and it allowed them to wash their clothes, it allowed them whatever, whatever they need to do with water, right? Um, and, and, um, and, and so that traveled with them. Interesting to note, there's a, there's a Talmud that says, where is that well of Miriam now? Where is it, right? 
So the Torah tells us that it was there. The Be'er Shal Miriam. The Miriam's well. It was in honor of Miriam. Where is it? So the Talmud tells us it's actually in the Kinneret. It's in the, it's in the, the um, in, Ti in Tiberias, in Tiberia, you know, the Kinneret. That is um, that, that beautiful that beautiful body of water and that's that, that used to separate Israel with with um, you know with with uh, Jordan but but um, it, it is it is no longer because um, um, no longer did it did it be, because in in, in um, I think in in 67 they got it back so the, it landed up in the canary it landed up in the canary and that's what they say that's where it is so did King Herod tap into, tap into that? I'm not, it's, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know where he got his water from. So we know he was close to the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea is not potable. The other thing God created, the other thing God created was the, the, the horse, the donkey's mouth. So Bilam, wicked Bilam, was hired by wicked Balak to curse the Jewish people. He had the ability to curse. He had a, a certain, certain, uh, you know, you know. Most people can't curse. By the way, I always tell people, "Hey, curse me, curse me." I said, well, "Are they a gypsy? Yeah, I mean, that you know of. Are they, you know, you don't give any credence to curses. You just don't. Blessings, yes. Curses, no. If somebody curses me, okay, you know, then they cursed, right? Um, the Canaret provides water, by the way, for much of Israel. So, um, and it comes in from the north and it heads down to the south. So, the, the, um, so when he hired him to curse, and he was a known, proven cursor. So he had powers, he was a gypsy. And God told him not to go, but he said, you know, I can make a lot of money and a lot of prestige. The king himself sent high level officials. They sent the secretary of the interior, they sent the secretary of defense, you know. Please, please come, please come. So God acquiesced. But God did not know that he was going to go. I mean, God did know, but God didn't. He, he, he went that second. And God was upset. You know, oh, you're so eager to curse the Jewish people that you didn't even pack. So God made, uh, so he was sitting on his donkey, mm -hmm. riding on his donkey. And the donkey stopped three times because there was an angel blocking the donkey from continuing as the Torah tells us Bilam hit the donkey finally the donkey turns to Bilam and says why'd you hit me have I ever done anything bad to you he says because you stopped and he says well is that my normal behavior Bil uh, you know, Bilam is that my normal behavior that I stop and so he said no so they had this dialogue so that ability for this donkey to speak was done in at, at twilight. Now they do say, they do say, that in the Talmud that King Solomon had the uncanny ability to converse with animals. So like you see with Tarzan, you know, when he's telling the the elephant Amagawa, right? King Solomon had the ability to converse with animals. So um, you know, I don't know what that means. So maybe he, you know, he had a general idea. I have no idea. I have no idea. But um, but here it was, the Torah tells us the dialogue that the donkey had with Bilam. Right? The next thing that was created at twilight was the rainbow. Even though God didn't use that rainbow for 1600 years, others say it was, he did use it, it was like a regular rainbow, but now he, he so there's different opinions. But for 1600 years, the rainbow meant nothing, that's for sure. And then after the flood, when Noah offered up a sacrifice to God, God said, you know what? I'm not going to destroy the world again. Dr. Doodle was very funny. I'm not going to destroy the world again. I, and, and I'm going to make a covenant and I'm going to put a sign in the sky that whenever I am thinking and contemplating of destroying the world, I'll put this sign up. And um, and and I will forgive. So when we once again when we see a rainbow, it's not necessarily 
it's we make a blessing that thank you God for remembering your promise that's the blessing we make um, but um, it, 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 it is a, a uh, um, and the rainbow the rainbow is, is is that God is is not fully happy with our behavior and especially this election season I'm surprised there's not thousands of rainbows in the sky saying guys stop it stop it already um, so the rainbow, and as I said, we do make a blessing. So the idea of the rainbow is not just the, the, the um, uh, you know, the wind uh, moving the rain and, and, and uh, the prism um, effect, but rather it means something. And that's in general in life, right? The Baal Shem Tov said that whenever, whenever you come across something, realize it is a, a sign for you. Right? Nothing is happenstance. Nothing is random. So you you know, you, you come across somebody, there's a reason. You come across something, there's a reason. So a rainbow is also a reason. The the uh, the next thing on our list is manna. The manna that God provided the Hebrews in the desert for forty years was created. God made it on the on the he made it at twilight, and he provided this manna, which could taste like anything. You just had to, it was very versatile. You could make anything. It was either like a, like a potato or an eggplant that's so versatile, or unfortunately, I have a hunch that it was like tofu, because it just uh, was also extremely versatile in so many different things. I'm kind of hoping it's the potato, but, um, I, but I, have a hunch it's not so the manna um, the manna was 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 created at twilight the next thing that was created at twilight was Moses stick the one where God said lift up your stick and the waters will turn to blood lift up your stick and the waters will split lift up your stick and there will be you know darkness lift up your stick so that stick that hit the, you know, most hit the rock with and, and speak to the rock, it was all with that same stick. There is a midrash of where Moses found that stick. If you listen to this midrash, which was written thousands of years ago, it's going to set off bells and alarms. The midrash says as follows. The Moses ran away from Egypt. He was 20 something years old. He ran away from Egypt and he ran to Midian, the neighboring country, and he and he, because his life was at risk. He ran and he was at met he met a couple of girls at the well. He pushed off the rock. They they he, he he watered their animals and they brought him home and they introduced him to the father. This is the man that was so kind to us. The Midrash says that. The father's name was Isro, Jethro, as we know. Jethro had a large backyard. It was probably one acre zoning. He had a large backyard. In his backyard, there was this stick in the lawn, in the grass. And it was immovable. Pull it, pull it, pull it. It didn't come up. It had strange Hebrew letters written on it, and and um, and, and uh, it, it it you know it actually had the name of God on it, um, and strange Hebrew letters written on it, and nobody could. So Jethro, they, when they said that this man is a holy man, is the, he says, "Come out to the backyard." He says, "Could you lift that stick? Because if you can, you get to marry my daughter." So they so the midrash tells us that Moshe went to the backyard, took the stick, and he pulled it out like you would pull something out of butter, jello, not frozen butter, jello. Sound familiar? Sound like Excalibur. So this is Moses' Excalibur. This is, uh, and perhaps, perhaps, this is where they got the story of King Arthur and the Round Table and Jethro, and Jethro was a leader, a chieftain. You know, it's, it's maybe, we, Look, we do know that Star Wars is definitely, Star Wars is a very Kabbalistic concept. Star Wars. 
the dark side of the force, the good side of the force. This is all Kabbalah, right? So it could be that somebody with an imagination um, read King Arthur, uh, read, read, read Moses the Midrash and came up with King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Now, so the stick that Moses used. The next thing was the Shamir. The Shamir we discussed is, um, that is a worm that secretes acid that actually when you place it on stone and it secretes acid, it weakens the stone where it secreted, where it peed. And, um, and that's how they built, Solomon built the Holy Temple. He built the Holy Temple by placing this Shamir worm on a stone, it was a huge stone, and the Shamir worm traveled across the stone. Then they were able to break the stone in half or quarter, and they had these Shamir worms go, working all the time. Right? So um, I, you know, I, I know these Shamir worms took up human labor, and I'm sure the ACLU and you know, you know the the unions have something to say about it. But um, that that's what Solomon used because he was not allowed to use iron to cut the stones. The next thing God created was the Ten Commandments. So it was a sapphire block. God got it ready. God also created the letters that would be on it. The letters were miraculous. The stone, because you could read it from both sides of the stone, you could read it. So usually the other side of the stone, it was carved all the way through, should be backwards, but it wasn't. So that miracle of the, the luchot God created, of the tablets God created during the, the, the twilight. The next thing, God created with demons. So we know angels were created on the second day, but demons are not angels. Demons are negative energy. Angels are energy, work for God, positive energy. Demons are a negative energy, and um, they, they, in the times of the Talmud, they used to have a real trouble with them um, in ruins. Like you, weren't, you couldn't go to a ruin at night because of the demons. Mazikim, they cause damage. I don't know much about them. The Talmud in Bracha talks about them a little bit, that they're in ruins and uh, they'll, they'll only attack if you walk alone. They won't attack if you walk in pairs. I, I don't know much about them. I, I don't know if they're, you know, if they're around today. I mean, you know, when you use the word demon, it seems so, you know, it seems like Harry Potter-ish, but I said that demons were created. A negative energy, a destructive energy, force. That's what demons are. So it doesn't have to be like a demon in terms of an angel, but maybe, maybe it's a destructive force. So, so the ability for the waters to create a tsunami, maybe that's what they mean. Not a thousand percent sure. But it does say in the Talmud about demons occupying ruins. God also designated and set aside on twilight Moses' burial place. So nobody knows where Moses is born. No, nobody knows where Moses is buried. Nobody. Nobody. It's just not a, um, um, you know, God didn't want it to become a shrine. He didn't want it to become uh, um, another graystone. And, um, and this is where the great Moses is buried. So therefore, Moses was buried in, in, in um, only, uh, only um, you know, God knows he died of Piyashem. God brought him up. God laid him down. God kissed him. And he died. But nobody knows where he's buried. But whatever that is, wherever that is, God created it, got it ready. Whatever that means, um, I wonder if it was like a, you know, a, like a, a good-looking place with a, a room with a view. Um, I don't know. the The second to last thing is is the the ram's horn. So when Abraham offered up. Isaac, as he was told to, and he was about to slaughter him as he thought he should. And all of a sudden, an angel stopped him. And he said, no, 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 no. This was just a test to see if you would. And the fact that you did was incredible, the fact that you did. Abraham looked up, and he sees a ram caught in the thicket. 
and he took that ram he slaughtered and offered it to God in Isaac's stead and he took this ram's horn and blew it when did this happen on Rosh Hashanah that's one of the reasons why we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah because Abraham blew it to, 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 as a tribute to God and God was very impressed that Abraham would listen to him even to the point of, of, of the unthinkable so um, that ram with a horn where it was going to be etc was made was made on on the uh, twilight now it's interesting they say according to Jewish legend is that when Mashiach comes when Messiah comes that horn the very same horn is going to be blown again so we'll have to wait and see the last thing which seems like a very interesting thing a very practical thing and not necessarily a miracle or anything like that is God created the first tongues so you know in order to hold something in in, in the fire glass blowers etc they have to have a tongue and this tongue is metal but how do you make it a tongue you have to forge it in fire any tongue that is made is forged in fire how did you make the first tongue if you didn't have a tongue simple God made it so the first the original tongue was made by God and every successive tongue after that was uh, was made by humans using that tongue and you know and and who knows where that tongue is now um, so those are the those are the these are the things I think there are 14 a total of 14 things the Mishnah quotes 10 and then and then it adds to the other four um, but these are the things that were created um, on the sixth day um, when we meet again we're going to talk about the seventh day the seventh day we're going to talk about what was created on the seventh day what is so special about the seventh day and then we'll be able to get into Genesis chapter 2. If you have questions, you can ask them here. If you, um, uh, you can also email me at rabbi at the high center, rabbi at the high I would also ask you, but I don't, I don't think I've ever asked you before, but you feel free to share these videos or tell somebody if you're enjoying them, clue somebody else in that these videos take place Monday through Thursday, sometimes Friday, um, at one o'clock, and, um, and ask them to join. They can also watch it later. And um, if you wanna watch it later, it's thechaisenter.com forward slash academy. Be well, and God bless.